Okay, so this video is about government-led adaptation and mitigation strategies for global climate change as part of the Ivy Geography Global Climate Syllabus. So these are the subtopics that we'll discuss. So global geopolitical efforts, carbon emissions, offsetting and trading, and then technology such as geoengineering. So first, let's start with some definitions. Okay, so mitigation is any action taken to eliminate or reduce the long-term impacts of climate change through reducing the sources of or increasing the sinks of greenhouse gases. And adaptation, on the other hand, is the management of the risks posed by global climate change in order to moderate the harm or take advantage of the opportunities. Okay, so first of all, global geopolitical efforts. So we're going to do a timeline of the global geopolitical efforts that have been made in terms of um, diminishing the impacts of climate change. And one thing to recognize is that the source or sources of greenhouse gas emissions may be spatially distant from the countries most impacted. Um, and that kind of creates a need for global recognition of the issue um, because it can affect nations that may not necessarily be involved. Um, okay, so starting off in 1988, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change was set up by the UN and the World Meteorological Organization. They carry out detailed research into the enhanced greenhouse effect and the role of human activity in climate change. Okay, and then in 1992, the Earth Summit took place in Rio. 190 countries signed a treaty agreeing that the global community should achieve stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a low enough level to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And then in 1997, the Kyoto Protocol of World Leaders who agreed to legally binding greenhouse gas emissions reduction target took place. However, the US did not sign it, which kind of diminished its value because the US is quite a large has a large influence in geopolitical efforts globally. And then in 2009, the UN did hold meetings from 2009 until 2011, but they did not meet a legally binding agreement, though various HICs set up a, U a 100 billion dollar, a 100 billion US dollar green fund for poorer countries by 2020. And in the 2015, the and in 2015, the UN negotiated the Paris Agreement with 195 countries to achieve reductions in greenhouse gases that will not allow future temperatures to exceed 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Okay, now we're going to look at um, carbon emissions offsetting and trading. Okay, so first of all, carbon offsetting, what is it? It's where people can invest into an offsetting scheme to neutralize the effects of their remaining carbon dioxide emissions. Rather than planting trees or investing in a reforestation project, people can now buy carbon credits to establish an ongoing program of carbon offsetting so that for every new transaction, you can buy more credits to cancel out your emissions. So what are the advantages here? Well, credits are linked to a wide array of environmentally friendly projects, such as protecting the Amazon rainforest and renewable electricity to communities in developing countries. Used heavily in the air travel industry, people can pay a bit more for their plane tickets and offset their flights. Projects can deliver value for local communities as well as the environment. Cons, however, are that it might not reduce the volume of emissions being generated. It has been criticized by organi organizations such as Greenpeace for being ineffective. Carbon trading is basically a market-based system uh, aimed at reducing greenhouse gases that contribute to global warming, particularly carbon dioxide emitted by burning fossil fuels. It sets an overall limit or cap on the amount of emission that are allowed, emissions that are allowed from significant sources of carbon. And governments issue permits up to the agreed limit, which are given for free or to auction or auction to companies. Advantages here are that it can tackle certain gases such as sulfur dioxide, which helps to limit acid rain, such as in the US. It's easier to implement than expensive direct regulations and unpopular carbon taxes. And if joined up globally, it could be very fast to decarbonize the world. And then on the other hand, the disadvantages are that it creates a market in something with no intrinsic value, such as carbon dioxide, which can be very difficult to kind of promote and create incentives within. When permits are given away for free, prices can collapse and no effective reductions in emissions are really made. And finally, some people believe that direct regulation is better and kind of Harsh regulation is just 
more kind of strict and it creates more kind of stronger limits upon people's carbon emissions okay now we're going to finally finally look at technology in terms of its adaptation and mitigation abilities in global climate change particularly by the government okay so First of all, we're going to look at renewable energy alternatives. So this is basically changing energy sources to renewable alternatives using existing flows of energy and natural processes. So the pros here are that there's been lots of investment that has been spurred by the oil crises of the 1970s. And during that decade, the use of renewable energy alternatives kind of accelerated sharply. And it is largely the it's largely growing in Europe, where in 2011, renewable energy accounted for over 30% of its electric capacity. It's not finite or polluting. It's good for winter weather in the UK when it is more windy and winds have higher speeds. The disadvantages, however, are that this, there's a need for sophisticated technology. So it may be inaccessible for LICs. It may be expensive. It will not be the end or be all solution. It can't fix all of the impacts of climate change. It's more rely more expensive than fossil fuels as well in some cases. However, if more people invest in it, the cheap the prices may fall, particularly if the government subsidizes it. Okay, now we'll look at geoengineering. So this is the deliberate large scale intervention in the Earth's natural systems to counteract climate change. So what are the pros here? Well, it could offset all the warming from a doubling of carbon dioxide. Honestly, I don't know what that means. Okay, it's affordable and feasible um, given that the technologies are well developed. It definitely does work. Honestly, can I just delete this because I don't really know why it's here. Okay, pros. It's innovative and there are a lot of different options and that means that governments can, you know, try different options. However, I feel like that could come with a lot of cons because if you invest a lot of money, you want it to work well and you don't really know the long-term effects of certain geoengineering projects. It reduce. It can also alter regional climates with potential disastrous effects such as famines. Okay, honestly, to people watching this, I don't really know why there are these random notes here. Um... I'm just going to change it. Okay, so here we can see that I've changed it. So they, it can be very successful and it's kind of a 50-50. It's like a you don't know if it's going to be successful. So that kind of you need to balance that out by saying that it could have disastrous effects in the long term. Also, there's inequality issues in access in terms of income and education because geoengineering is kind of less of an option in LICs who don't have kind of the resources to really carry out such large scale intervention. Okay, finally, carbon capture and sequestration. Okay, so this is a set of technologies that can greatly reduce carbon dioxide emissions from new and existing coal and gas fired power plants and large industrial sources. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of the method used. So capture of carbon dioxide from power plants and industrial processes, then it's transported, um, the captured carbon is transported and compressed, then it's injected underground um, into deep underground rock formations. Okay, so the pros here are that it reduces greenhouse gases whilst also enabling low carbon electricity generation from power plants. It's good at eliminating climate change, has a capture rate of 90% according to Yuan Wang, um, his, his source. And then several options for underground storage of geological sequestration such as in the deep ocean in abandoned oil and gas reservoirs and basal formation storage the cons however are that there is a large complexity in the industrial processes there's little conclusive research that points to the absolute security of underground carbon dioxide storage it is also impossible that microbes living in volcanic rocks break down carbonates to methane Natural disasters can disrupt the storage processes and there's concern of leakages and environmental contamination. So these are all the kind of options that the government has to kind of mitigate and maybe adapt to the impacts of global climate change.